Hello and good afternoon. Uh, I'm Michael Casey. I'm the Chief Content Officer at Coindesk and it's an absolute pleasure to be here. So today we're going to be talking about uh, tokenized economies. Uh, what does that mean? Well, we'll let the panel discuss that. But um, I think one of the things that's really interesting about the title, it sort of has this uh, something coming alive. And what strikes me about that is like, you know, we're in this moment. Let's not, everyone seems to understand crypto is having a bit of a moment right now. Uh, and there's a, there's a big discussion around, is it worth anything? Is there anything actually useful that's being happening in this space? And the reality is there's a lot. And a lot of it revolves around how aspects of our lives are being tokenized. And sometimes in ways we don't even understand. And there's a lot that's happening. In fact, in a meeting that I was in this morning, uh, we, we talked about whether or not we should get away from the word use case and start talking about case studies, because case studies is a discussion about what's actually happening. So we're going to go through that. And I think, Jeremy, yesterday you, you were on stage with Neil Ferguson and, and Katie Martin, who's a tremendous uh, reporter, who used to actually work with me at, 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 uh, at Wall Street Journal, um, asked a question, isn't it about time that crypto did something useful? And I think hopefully what we'll do is a bit of a discussion of the fact that there's actually a lot going on. Before we get into that, though, very, very quickly, because we have limited time, each of you just introduce yourselves if you could. That's the easiest way to do this, Jeremy. Sure. I'm Jeremy Allaire. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Circle. Uh, we operate and issue uh, the largest regulated digital dollar in the world, USDC, uh, and have uh, founded the company 10 years ago. And um, you know, it's an infrastructure uh, and digital currency company. Uh, and we'll, we'll connect the dots to the theme, uh, I'm sure, in the conversation. Beryl? Hi, um, I'm Beryl Lee. I'm co-founder at Yield Yield Games. Uh, we are a guild of guilds. Um, we actually acquire a number of NFT gaming assets. And we started in the Philippines when we, we lent our NFT assets to our communities. And now uh, we see ourselves in uh, Latin America, India, um, and most emerging markets. Top. Hello, everyone. Uh, first of all, thank you uh, for having me here. And I'm glad to, to be back again this year. Uh, my name is Top from, uh, from Thailand. We are the largest uh, blockchain and digital asset uh, group, of, group of companies. Uh, we have everything from the regulated digital asset exchange, from NFT marketplace, from our own blockchain, our own you know, uh, academy. We have our own ventures. Overall, we have a, a thousand com uh, employees in, in Thailand. And we be became the, uh, the first Thai uh, fintech uh, unicorn in the mm -hmm. country. Yeah. Thank you. Wow, congratulations. Timo. Uh, Good afternoon. It's great to be here. I'm Timo Harakka, the Minister of Transport and Communications of Finland. And uh, I tried to make the deal with other panelists that uh, <laughs> for, for once, when you have a politician on stage, he would just listen and the others could talk. Because it's a big learning uh, uh, curve for me to, to, to kind of get uh, to the grips of Web 3.0 and all the aspects of it. And we in the, uh, in the government are trying to uh, make the sense and the implications, uh, regulatory and legislation implications of Web 3.0. And uh, this is really a, a, an educational uh, moment for me. Yeah, and so you can happily listen, but I'm not doing a deal. You will be <laughs> called upon and you will have to speak. <laughs> OK, good. Um, this is Jeremy, why don't I throw to you? Because there's something interesting about the role that I think Circle uh, plays as you know, essentially a participant in all these other, all these other ecosystems, the, the USDC, the, the stable coin that, that Circle issues, it's being used in all these environments. And I think you're probably getting an interesting perspective about um, the variety of tokenized uh, activities there. So maybe you can just give us a landscape description, perhaps. Sure. And, and actually, you know, I, I think um, a, a, a lot of the, the conversation is often around, you know, uh, you know how, how do we get real world utility? Um, and, and what is the value of tokenization and, and everything else? Um, and you know, I think you know, our, our vision was how can we use a, you know, the, the benefits of, of blockchain technology, which is a, an, an open environment for transactions, uh, immutable uh, records, uh, global interoperability, a lot of these advantages, and tokenize the dollar. Uh, and so, um, you know, we're, we're not trying to uh, introduce a new currency to the world. We're trying to uh, take the power of this technology um, and imbue that power onto the dollar. Um, and as I like to say, give the dollar the superpowers of the internet. And so, 
Um, the, the phrase uh, tokenizing real world assets is something that people are talking about a lot now. Well, the dollar happens to be probably the most important real world asset uh, in, in the world. Um, and we've, we've tokenized that in a regulated way. And, um, and so it's, it's, a, it's a foundational building block. And you know, because blockchains are open and program programmable to anyone in the world, exactly what you said, we find ourselves at uh, you know, connecting to so many other uh, case studies, um, whether <laughs> they be international transactions, uh, cross-border transactions, remittance transactions, capital markets transactions, lending transactions as a payment medium, so many use cases, uh, sorry, uh, right. that, that you have for a dollar. Um, yeah. but, but bringing that to, um, to an, uh, you know, a, a kind of use on the public internet in, in an open interoperable. Before we jump to Beryl, who will give us a case study, um, the programmability it is interesting here, right? Why don't we just, can you just drill down on that into a little bit here? You said the power of the internet, it's almost like, you know, in, in the meeting I just had at Circle, we talked about um, money is a unit of account, store, store of value, um, and of course a medium of exchange. But now in an, in an internet, in, in a tokenized environment, it becomes programmable. Like, yeah. what, what do we mean by that? What is the power well, of the internet in this programmable sense? I mean, there, there are a couple of ways to think about that. I, I, think, I think the first is, I think we all intuitively grasp that when we've digitized something like a photo or a piece of content or, or something else, that it, it becomes this thing that's shareable and transmittable and, and, and in the world. It sort of it becomes this tangible digital thing that is in the world. And that's really powerful because we intuitively understand I can take that photo and I can beam it anywhere to anyone and it just works. And so that's, that's one is that you have a, a token that represents a dollar and, and it can do that. But the, the blockchain technology, the, the, the fundamental innovation is that you can also write code uh, that can interact with those assets. So you can write code that, for example, says, you know, release this value to someone based on an event that happens. Uh, or um, I, I want to put value into this contract and someone else can use that value for a period of time and pay it back with an interest rate. And so you have the ability to write contracts. Those could be contracts that are written about a particular commercial relationship. Those could be uh, traditional financial contracts um, and, and write code to interact with that. That just has never been possible before and, and, and uh, never been possible at least in a way in which that, uh, that, that code lives on the internet and is, is, is trusted and secure and, and anyone can interact with it. So right. it's, a, it's a breakthrough and programmable composable money is it's a mouthful, uh, <laughs> but um, you know, is is sort of lighting up the utility value of money. Uh, it's it's lighting up um, the utility value of money in just extraordinary ways. And we're we're kind of like in the you know the the 2006 2007 era of this, where you know people all these people had ideas about smartphones and mobile apps and what you could do, but nothing had actually been invented. And then the platforms emerged, and it's extraordinary what people uh, have been in, been able to invent with you know, writing code to put on a mobile device. And so it's, it's, we're in a similar place in terms of the, pro, the, the applications that will be built that use programmable money. Okay. And so Jeremy just said something, barely he said, like, you know, an event happens and then you can pay somebody with tokens, right? That's in some respects, at its core, what's happening in the kind of games that uh, uh, YGG is, is working with, right? So, you know, tell us what, what opportunities, what are these uses that you're seeing for this programmable tokenized mm -hmm. uh, existences? So I can speak in the perspective of gaming, right? So there are 3 billion uh, gamers um, in the world. So we've actually looked into Roblox or World of Warcraft where gamers are actually trading shields and swords or building certain like gaming assets on Roblox. But whenever they actually exchange hands of these like assets from one person to another, they don't own the assets. They, they don't actually maximize the profitability of these, of these assets that they actually create or they've actually utilized. But with Web3 gaming, um, there's the ability to actually uh, utilize these uh, gaming assets to actually play in the game. And um, in exchange, they're able to actually earn um, in-game rewards, for example, which could actually be exchanged into real-world um, real uh, assets, for example, uh, go to Starbucks or uh, into another form of cryptocurrency or uh, stablecoin. 
right? Um, so this a classic example was during the pandemic uh, in the Philippines where uh, Play to Earn actually started uh, uh, with a game called Axie Infinity. You're able to actually play the game with battling with three axes in exchange earning um, uh, in the form of uh, smooth Love Potion, SLP. But then players figured out that they're able to actually convert these into Philippine pesos or um, fiat. And they're able to actually buy milk for their kids, uh, put food on the table during a time when um, everyone is actually on lockdowns, right? Um, and um, it was also very interesting because uh, there is a proliferation of various roles in this new economy. Um, so, uh, so with, uh, with tokenization, it's actually in the form of uh, non-fungible tokens or gaming assets. Mm -hmm. Right. There's a whole other, there's a tokenizing not of the, the money in this case, but of these, these assets, these digital these objects assets. in a way. You know, I think one of the things that, that people sometimes say, okay, so gaming, you know, what's the, what's the utility in that? And yet the reality is like, how big is the gaming world? How, how many people play, play games worldwide? So worldwide, there's about uh, 2.9 uh, billion, so almost 3 billion uh, people in the world playing games. Okay. They indulge in esports, um, and an average gamer actually spends 14% of their waking hours playing games. So uh, you get a sense of what that economy is, right? So we can call it real or not, but that's a re that is a huge chunk of the digital economy right there. And the fact that we're now translating and shifting some of the value away from just the the gaming companies and there's essentially a transfer of wealth through this tokenization to the participants in that game is a very interesting model I, just, I find it a fascinating way to think about where we could go not just with games but things like you know ai research or something else right where we're all participating in the digitization of information and somehow being rewarded rather than just being sort of passively uh, having our data extracted and i want to talk to you about data because i know you're yeah. interested in it top um what what you know you've just got so many different pieces going on uh with this you know that entirely tie focused conglomerate um what, what, what are you excited about what do you mean what in, in sort of where do you see in this web3 environment the most interesting forms of new utility new use cases and, and tokenization sure um the reason why i have so many pieces uh is because i've been in this space for eight years now Okay. Uh, similar time you know, to with Jeremy and, and Beryl. Um, and, but I have been focusing on just one country and we fully conquered you know, Thailand. And you know, Thailand is a small country, but surprisingly we are quite advanced in terms of um, blockchain applications and, and use cases. For example, the central, Thai central bank governor was here at Davos last year on the stage talking about CBDCs, mm -hmm. central bank digital currency. It was going to be launched in Q4 uh, last year, but it, it, we got a bit delayed you know, to Q1 this year. But we're going to start uh, with the wholesale, not the retail, wholesale CBDC first. Uh, Thai government, uh, Thai central bank is working with the MAS, Singapore MAS, for the you know, wholesale remittance between the two uh, countries. And th that's the first real you know, blockchain use cases. Or you know, last year was a tough year uh, with uh, FTX, um, you know, the unregulated players, messing the space up, but the regulated players are being punished. Uh, even the regulation is, 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 being, is very advanced. For example, in, in June this year, there'll be a new requirements on ca capital requirements, NCR, on top of our customers' deposits. We have $2 billion worth of customers' deposits right now, and we keep 10% on the hot wallet. Dollar to dollar, one to one, um, but we have to have an additional $200 million of our own cash on top. Right? So we need to uh, Thailand is quite advanced, but we don't have this standardization of governance or transparency um, yet. Uh, and another issue is the uh, standardization on the interoperability that we discussed uh, this morning. Uh, on the capital, future of capital market, uh, the blockchain application on the future of the capital market, uh, the previous session that I attended, uh, the CEO of New York Stock Exchange, she said that T plus two is settlement time is no longer accept ac acceptable in today's world, right? And I've been saying that for a very long time, but yes. <laughs> so they're exploring, you know, DLT, you know, blockchain. Uh, but for Thailand, we are, you know, planning to issue a separate, uh, what we call uh, an investment token, which is a separate license uh, from a crypto token, mm. uh, where, where traditional finance can tokenize all kinds of values ranging from you know, government bonds. We can tokenize government bonds. We can tokenize carbon credit trading. We can to tokenize FX, right? currency exchange, 
electricity, electricity unit. Mm. Right? Um, just a bit of a background to the audience here. Uh, with the blockchain technology, it creates digital scarcity versus the internet that it creates digital abundance. For the first time in humanity that we are, we are able to achieve digital scarcity. That means we can have a digital representation. To tokenization is a digital representation of values, right? meaning that we can upload any kind of values online into the digital economy, meaning that tokenization will be the underlying foundation of the digital economy go going forward. We can tokenize anything now. And in Thailand, we are issuing a separate investment tokens so that there will be a new fundraising method, method mm -hmm. right, going forward. Um, which is quite advanced compared to others. Yeah, I think the capital markets use case is, is I'm, I keep saying the word use case, it's just, but it, it is one of those ones that's immediately understandable. And I think also potentially, Timo, is um, uh, one that translates directly to a question that, that, that governments and regulators, because they, they, they've regulated capital markets so heavily, this idea that, that we can tokenize these real world assets, that we can turn a bond into a fractionalized version of a digital digital bond or a real estate or an energy claim or whatever. Um, what do you, do you have any thoughts on this? And on, 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 cause you know, from a regulatory perspective, um, are, are regulatory regimes ready uh, in, in Europe for the, the kind of uh, tokenized capital market investment token idea that Top's talking about? Well, uh to a certain extent, yes, we are eagerly waiting for EU uh, views and, and recommendations on, on, on various issues uh, uh, concerning uh, Web 3.0. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, as the basic problem is that none of those uh, tokenized or crypto uh, actors want to have a national uh, regulation. So this is a huge beef in US, I'm, I'm aware of that, mm. with the CEC and so forth. Uh, but we need to have some clarity. Now, we have three issues that uh, concern a politician. If I go to uh, you know, meet uh, voters and I start talking about tokens and cryptos, so they say it's a scam. We all read the papers, it's just uh, it's a scam. So there is a case to be made, and there uh, you need to kind of convince people that there re really is a utility. So transparency, uh, ironically, uh, is issue number one, because you're supposed to have the transparency with uh, blockchain, but then all, all these scandals have done with uh, uh, the lack of transparency. Second is the issues of trust and identity. I think these will be very important uh, in the future. How do we ensure that uh, uh, relevant uh, uh, identification is taken care of uh, in a blockchain environment, also beyond finance, uh, that uh, we need to make a compromise? And, and the third one uh, is uh, uh, obviously uh, uh, trust in general. So these are the issues that we, we are dealing with. And, and a lot of uh, new players and actors in Web 3.0 world are not something that uh, uh, reflect very well in existing legislation. Uh, take a DAO, for instance. Uh, so uh, where, does, where does legislation uh, stand for? Who is representing uh, a, a blockchain or, or a crypto exchange if it's a DAO? Or, or Web 3.0 uh, entity. I was very uh, excited about what you were saying about gaming and what, what's the difference between gaming and other activities in the digital world is, is becoming uh, kind of uh, uh, blurred. For instance, uh, the, the most promising cases of metaverse experience are games. And you have a lot of real world uh, entertainment already in the gaming world. You have Ariana Grande in, in, in Fortnite. You have US TV, US TV shows in Fortnite. So there's a, there's a, a, a really interesting uh, avenue on there, and I'm sure that they'll be uh, really promising. So let's open this up to discussion about the, we didn't want to make this necessarily a regulation discussion, but I think it's an interesting way to think about this, because when you start talking about these interesting applications uh, that Web3 apply, you're saying gaming and entertainment and so forth, right? We wouldn't think of regulating entertainment, right? I mean, all of a sudden you've got all sorts of free speech concerns and everything else here. You know, there's regulation of all sorts of behavior around that. But, like, 
you know, it's, it's, I think one of the problems, Jeremy, in the way that these debates have been happening around crypto and tokens is that there's a blurring of the lines between what is the actual product and the, the application versus the underlying technology. And I mean, how do you think about that particular challenge? Yeah, I mean, you have to kind of break down the different layers of this, I think. Like blockchains themselves are basically operating systems. Mm -hmm. That it's a, they're new operating system layers on the internet. And it's not the role of a financial regulator to regulate, you know, operating systems. Just like, you know, financial regulators or departments of commerce aren't regulating the World Wide Web as a technology. So you have a, a, a base layer and the technology is indifferent to the application, just like TCPIP, the protocol of the internet, is totally indifferent to the application. You know, extremists can use it, and uh, free societies can use it, and defense departments can use it, and everyone can use TCPIP. There's no bias there. Um, and so blockchains are this kind of base layer um, that, that is there um, that, you know, you, you don't regulate that. Now, there, there may be, there is this invention, right, of digital commodities. And digital commodities now exist, and digital commodities um, have economic value, and they're traded like other commodities. And so there are regulators for trading commodities, and there are regulations for commodities exchanges. And, and so that's coming into play. And, and actually, there's a lot more regulation on the way in terms of digital asset commodities exchanges and, and the like. The blurry part starts to happen when you come up to the next layer, where you have people building applications and those applications are incredibly varied. Someone could be building a, a, an application that is uh, for um, you know, storing different parts of your digital identity and presenting that digital identity uh, to, to other applications. Well, who should regulate that? Should anyone regulate that? Um, should standards consortia be involved in that? That's not a financial regulatory matter, but it's important to everyone that there be standards or you have people building applications exactly like Yield Guild Games and, and some of these you know, Web3 games, right? Um, they have digital tokens. And those digital tokens can represent real world uh, assets and virtual assets. And it's probably not the job of a financial regulator to supervise in-game assets. I don't think anyone would, would want that. And we have parallels from the, the development of the internet. Um, there was a time when people thought that if you wanted to stream audio, that you needed a radio broadcast license. And that's absurd to us right now. I can take out my phone and I can stream audio to anyone in the world I want, and I don't need a license. Uh, there might be a great firewall in some places where they might censor me, but I have the freedom to do that, and regulators adapted to that. And so you know, the, the digital assets that exist, that represent value, that are connected to virtual assets and real world assets, it, th these, these lines are blurred and these, and these are, are, are increasingly global. And so we have to, my belief, and this gets to the core of your question, I think, is governments have to do the hard work of coming up with statutory definitions of digital assets and clearly classifying, like, what is an investment token? What is digital property? What is a digital currency? Um, what, is, uh, you know, what is a digital commodity? And, and then, you know, and if, if there are companies that are involved in those, either issuing or intermediating them, are there rules that are needed? That's hard work that governments have to do. They can't just throw their arms in there in the air and say, oh, we already have regulation, we should just apply it. There's hard work to do. This is like when the internet emerged. There was hard work to do. So I think that's, that's really the work in front of us is we have to get into the topology and definitions and then figure out the, the kind of risk reward against um, you know, the, the, the levels of kind of uh, licensing that you might have around some of those activities. I want to throw to questions in just one moment, but I want to pick up just a little bit more on this and maybe both Beryl and Top could weigh in here because the, this topology idea, the idea of like, like what, what language are we using to define these different types of tokens, my sense is that the reason why politicians maybe get confused is because it's been overly associated with, with speculation in markets, that that... The, the framework with which we talk about, and this is actually maybe the industry's fault as much as anything else, these assets, is through this lens of a speculative investment activity. And it's why people like Gary Gensel, the chairman of the SEC, basically says every token is a security. And then now we've got nothing but this sort of limited framework to think about it. How do we, how do you think we should, because you clearly do not want to be, you know, the, the, the NFTs that you're dealing with 
uh, and with Yield Guild Games, you don't want them to be treated like a security, right? And it just seems entirely inappropriate because if it's just like a baseball, we wouldn't want a baseball trading card to be regulated by the SEC. How do we, you know, how do you look at this? Well, this is very interesting, right? Like um, there are existing um, regulatory frameworks and sometimes when you actually speak to regulators in um, uh, different parts of the world, they'd like to actually um, find an existing framework and apply to you when, uh, when it is in fact a new innovation in the space, right? Like um, uh, an NFT is a non-fungible token, uh, which could actually be applied to art, could actually be applied to a gaming asset, could actually be applied to an identity. And trading those NFTs doesn't necessarily uh, doesn't necessarily say, convert to like a security, right? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, yeah I mean, that seems to be the challenge. And is the do you think the Thai legislation, the Thai uh, new regulations that are coming out are going to appropriately distinguish between investment tokens and non-investment tokens and currencies and commodities? Um, I think they're in the progress of differentiating different types of tokens and they're learning on the go together with the develop developments of, of the market. Mm -hmm. um, but for me, um, to answer your, your, your questions on regulations and how, str how strict we should be, um, keyword here is fintech. Uh, no blockchain companies call themselves as a financial company, nor they don't, they don't also they don't call themselves as a technology company either, because we are talking about digital representation of values here. Right? Um, we can't move fast and break things like Facebook because in, in, even if in, imagine in-game assets, if the value gets bigger and bigger, it could be we could have another FTX mm -hmm. right, on the in-game in assets too, or laundering money or tourist. Finan tourism, uh, tourist financing mm. with the in-game assets as well. Um, so we cannot move fast and break things and have no KYC, no regulations at all. But at the same time, we, we don't call ourselves a financial company. We can't move slow and be mm. too strict, too costly. Otherwise, two billion people are, are st gonna, still going to be unbanked. Yeah. Because the cost of traditional banking is is is, is too high. Yeah, from bank point. I mean, they, it, these tokens are valuable, and that, that gives them this kind of money like financial like quality, even if they are literally just game objects and things, right? So it's a blurry line situation. I need to, to jump to, to the audience though, because this is a key part of the way that we do things here, uh, and open it up to questions. And, and maybe I'd like the minister to weigh in on some of this that we just we were just talking about. So, is there a question in the audience for us for this panel? or a comment. Yep, here we have in the middle over here. So if you don't mind, when you take the mic, please stand up and introduce yourself before, first. Hello, my name is Irshad. I'm from the Global Shapers community, uh, Kuala Lumpur Hub. I just want to hear your guys' thoughts in regards to a uh, non-custodial solution and how does that complements um, tokenization and stuff like that. Thank you. I'll take, I'll take a crack. Um, uh, you know, one of the innovations of this space is that um, if you have something like digital property, that you can actually take possession and control of the digital property. And, and that's really powerful. So wh whether that be uh, a representation of a dollar, the representation of a currency, your own identity data, whatever that, that would be, is that you can have possession and control. And this is, I think, part of the fundamental design of this technology is we're trying to move away from these giant centralized corporations or governments consolidating all of our data or consolidating our, our, our value. And so that's an, a core promise of the technology is that, you know, what's now called self-custody, that I can, I can possess my digital property and I can choose uh, who can access my identity information or how I want to transfer a digital item that I own to, to someone else. And so... It is, from my perspective, it's critical that we, um, we ensure that that direct, um, that direct control of our digital property can, can happen. And right now, um, the, 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 user, the, the end user that wants to do that today, it's, a, it's a still a too steep of a learning curve, and it's really scary. Um, so all of this is built up around um, you know, cryptography, and using cryptography to, uh, you know, kind of control who can access things, and so you know, using um, public key cryptography, which is the foundation of this, most people don't want to know about how to protect their private keys or what a seed phrase is. These are concepts that 
your average person would be really scared of. And they're scared of like, wow, you mean if I lose this, then I've lost my identity or I've lost my money or I've lost my property. And so it's still a problem that's not yet solved at a, at a, at a large scale. But I think um, it's interesting, you know, there's this you know, boom and bust cycle in these, in these things. But one of the areas that's getting a huge amount of capital right now and we've funded some startups in this space, and I think some of the smartest venture capitalists have as well, is people who are trying to build the next generation of what that end user, control your own, uh, control your own data, control your own identity, control your own money in a self-custody manner, and trying to solve that in a way where a billion people or two billion people could do that and not be handing it over to the Facebooks and, and, and Googles. Of or the, the, the Sam Bankman Freeds. Or to the Sam Bankman Freeds, to, to centralized entities that are, in, that are black box to right, us. Right. So it's a fundamental thing, and I think it's actually a, you know, my, my view is it's, it's, there's a kind of fundamental human right to be able to control your own property and data. Uh, maybe not every government agrees, um, but I think that's, that's built into this technology, and it's really important. Okay, Tim, I want to drink it over, but let yeah. me preface first. I think uh, Jeremy said something I think was very interesting, very relevant to a, a, a European uh, uh, politician, and that is, um, this idea that this architecture, this, this data architecture is actually fundamental to this new internet environment where we get away from the centralization of data itself. This whole problem of data and uh, privacy really being yeah. you know, a, one way to look at that. And of course, you know, the European Union is sort of, I think, at least in terms of its concerns about these matters, far ahead of any other you know, uh, government body trying to grapple with this. Indeed. Do you see the solutions that Jeremy's alluding to here as, as the way forward and are governments recognising that this, in fact, whether it's GDPR compliant or not, is, in fact, the way forward? I, I, I totally agree with Jeremy, and I think it's indeed a, a hugely important question. And we should move beyond privacy. So our main concern has been privacy, which means that people... Uh, the, the, the mindset is that people should restrict the data that they give away. If cancer research needs my data, I'm more than willing to give everything I have, uh, even private information, if that helps for this good purpose. So interestingly, uh, back, in, back in 2014, in Finland, uh, they started this, uh, this uh, association called My Data mydata.org, and that became global uh, in 2018. And our minister, the Minister of Transport and Communications, was the founders of this movement. And the core idea is exactly what you describe here, is that people should control their own data and be able to, to, uh, to divulge it wherever they want and also find wherever they don't want it to be handled. And this could be helped by all these kind of uh, decentralized operators that could be helpful there. And certainly, uh, our government and Finland has been proponent of this kind of uh, human-centric uh, control of data, free flow of data, uh, for, for almost 10 years. And certainly, the European legislation reflects some of, some of these issues. But we're still kind of uh, focused on the privacy issues. Mm. And, and rightly so, because you can kind of detect uh, uh, identities uh, by the transactions uh, uh, made in, 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 uh, in those ledgers. But still, we should go forward. We should go towards trust uh, and find all these use, use, useful uh, ways of enforcing trust mm. uh, uh, to be able to, to really utilize this huge amounts of data with the new tools. Uh, Beryl, I would like to bring you in because you talked a little bit yesterday when we chatted about this idea of accumulating data around your gaming behaviour and this mm -hmm. becoming a new form of identity. But just before we do, I just want to check, is there anybody with a question like this? Don. Uh, Don Tapscott. Uh, yeah, Don Tapscott. I'm chair of the Blockchain Research Institute. I have a question for Jerry, uh, Jeremy, but first, um, so it's a really good conversation. First of all, let me agree on this point about GDPR. We don't need, I mean, it's sure necessary, but it's insufficient. We, we don't need governments protecting our data. We need to own our data because this represents our digital identities and they've been expropriated from us. This is the asset exactly. class of the digital age. We need to get our identities back yeah. so that we can manage them responsibly. Uh, for ourselves. I wanted to uh, just underline Michael's point about taxonomy. 
uh, say something about that. Like a token's a representation. Another way of thinking of it is as a container where value kind of goes in the container. And right now we, we do need a taxonomy because of the problem that uh, Jeremy alluded to. Because there are, you know, there are natural asset tokens like carbon credits. There are protocol tokens that enable decentralized models to work. Um, there are uh, tokens that uh, represent art and music, NFTs and so on. So we spent some time thinking about this and developing a taxonomy. I think over time though, that will go away. Because just like a, a, a website was sort of a container for information for the old internet, uh, tokens will become containers of value and there'll be so many different types of them and it'll be pointless really to have a taxonomy to, to talk about all that. Anyway, editorial comment. Jeremy Circle submitted um, uh, for the Fed's uh, request on CBDCs. I wonder if you could just comment on that because it, it was a pretty articulate um, argument that stable coins can do everything that CDBCs can do without a lot of the liabilities and costs and so on. And, and I was just interested, do you apply that also to, uh, to wholesale CBDCs as well? Yeah, it, it's um, one of the most frequently asked questions that we deal with. Um, but I, I mean, look, th this is a very long topic and, and I'll try and keep it short because uh, 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 just in the interest of, of, of time, um, virtually every um, innovation in, in payment systems and electronic money has been driven by the private sector wire messaging, paper checks, ATM machines, credit cards, debit cards, PayPal, Apple Pay tokenization, stable coins. Every single innovation is private sector led. Um, and, uh, and I don't think that's gonna change in the realm of digital currency. And in fact, that is the case today. Um, there's far more digital dollar transactions happening on blockchains than central bank digital currency transactions happening even in China. That's the most advanced in this space and in fact, People in China don't even want to use the CBDC because the utility value of digital money in Alipay and, and WeChat is so high. Now, um, we have to differentiate between the, the, the technology and the, and the innovation cycles that are involved in what end user entities interact with, that's firms and households and individuals, from uh, the core architecture of central bank money itself. So I, I once asked uh, the chief information officer of the Federal Reserve, what's the architecture of the dollar? Because I know, you know the dollar is a technology system and I'm a technologist. And he said, it's an it's a Oracle database cluster on Sun Microsystems. I said, okay, that's, that's an old architecture, but you can imagine a, a new architecture for the core systems of the Fed built on you know, cryptographic money, uh, distributed ledger technology, and that that would improve settlement between them and their major participants and other central banks. And so that's the wholesale argument. And, and uh, there sort of seems to be an emerging consensus that yes, central banks should throw out old software and hardware and replace it with more modern technology. There's no one who's gonna argue with that, right? Like why should we hang on to 30 year old technology to operate those core systems? But if you're talking about facing the market and the innovation cycles that deliver value for billions of people and tens of millions of businesses, that is not gonna come from governments. That is absolutely only gonna come from the private sector. And I, I, it would be very difficult to, uh, to, to see how uh, it would happen otherwise. So uh, I, know there was, I saw another hand up a moment ago, but before I do, Beryl, I just wanna get back to that other point, because I thought it, was just, it just struck me as an interesting thing for you to weigh in on, where we were talking about my data, parceling it out, and, and that's sort of something of a static idea, but we also do a dynamic thing as well, right? There's, there's this new interactivity that comes with mm -hmm. this tokenized digital gaming environment that becomes a data pool in and of itself that then become a reputational thing. Talk a little bit, and you're actually developing tech around this, right? Uh, yes, that's right. Uh, based out of uh, gamer, uh, a gamer's activity. So uh, within um, our gamer pool, uh, we would actually know how many hours they actually spend in a game, uh, which games uh, they spend uh, they spend their time in, uh, how much they actually earn, uh, how 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 many times do they trade a particular asset, and you know with that particular data, there's just so much that you can build on top of it, right? Um, it's very rich. So, for example, you could actually extend other forms of financial services, like um, other forms of uncollateralized uh, loans, right, uh, for um, emerging market uh, gamers. Um, yeah, so what we're doing right now is uh, badging. Uh, we call them soul bound tokens. So we're tokenizing um, identity um, it, uh, by uh, looking into their achievements, um, being, them being able to 
uh, us being able to capture the skill that they have for a particular game, uh, being able to uh, measure the achievement uh, that they've uh, gone through, and then uh, creating a soul bound token uh, or an NFT by tokenizing that. And then based out of all these NFTs that um, a particular person collects, um, any other institution or uh, any Web3 application can, uh, can, can, can look into that data and match certain services hmm. based out of that. Fascinating. So I did see a hand. Uh, I think I saw Brett's. Did your hand was up? Okay, sorry. I'll come to you in a moment. We've got five minutes left, so let's try to keep it tight. My name is Brett McDowell. I'm the chair of the Hedera Network Governing Council. And this is a question, uh, quick premise. So the USDC's tokenization of the US dollar, is a well understood case study of tokenization. In-game asset, NFT tokenization of in-game in assets, a well understood case study. My question, uh, maybe for Top or anyone else, what next asset class do you think, what's the next real world thing that you are kind of excited about being tokenized? And kind of the next interesting uh, tokenized economy asset. Sure. Um, last year, I, I, I attended quite a few meetings in, in the Southeast Asian region. You know, G20, B20, even the Indonesian government, they are announcing a carbon credit trading ma marketplace. In Thailand, we are working on a similar thing. S same issues. We need standardization hmm. and interoperability for carbon credit you know, trading. Then here comes the blockchain application for, to tokenize carbon credit. In Thailand, we are issuing, thinking about issuing a, an investment token, meaning that uh, we can tokenize real estate. It's a new fundraising method. Right? Or even during the pandemic, uh, the Central Bank uh, of Thailand uh, used to talk to, to, to us and said that because Thailand relies uh, so much on tourism, and when there is no tourist uh, coming into the country, the FX spread you know, is impacted and there's not enough liquidity. They were asking if we could create an order book exchange instead of trading against an intermediary, uh, bricks and mortar intermediaries. Can we create an order book? Uh, can we tokenize FX so that we can, can have a deeper liquidity pool, right? And narrow, narrower spread. These are, or I mean, last year, the Minister of Finance um, issued a digital bond um, but only the primary market, meaning that if you need to use cash right away, you have to wait for another three years until the maturity. Right? Mm. Why can't we tokenize government bonds and trade them in a secondary on a secondary marketplace? The yeah, I mean, this, is ready. The, the, the ideas around this are phenomenal, right? The liquidity that suddenly goes into a bond market, the idea that you can fractionalize real estate. People say, maybe there'll be never, we will do away with rent. Everybody will be a part-time owner of their stake in a place that they're residing because they've got a fractionalized piece in it. You know, the, 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 the shifting of mindsets around how these economies function once you sort of bring that power of the digitalization in there is, is, is quite profound. One thing that, you know, some people might think is mundane, but I think it's very exciting is is you're seeing more and more major brands that want to replace their kind of proprietary databases of loyalty points. They want to replace those with um, non-fungible tokens. And so why? Uh, well, one is it goes from a closed loop e ecosystem to an open, interoperable open loop ecosystem. The second is that those, those then can manifest themselves with you know, a cryptographic proof of this that other applications can rely upon. And so my level of, of you know, Nike uh, value, and I can then prove that to the, uh, you know, the, the Boston Celtics uh, stadium, and they can manifest various forms of entitlements. So credentialing, entitlements, affinity, like, is a vast area for innovation, which has largely been kind of in these very closed down systems. That's a space where tokenization, I think, is unlocking a lot. And you're seeing big, big companies launching things in that space almost every week where it seems like we're seeing uh, things happening there. Really quick, yeah. we're short. <laughs> if you stand up and give us a seat, uh, take the mic and uh, introduce yourself if you don't mind, thank you. Yeah, my name is Joseph Bismarck. I'm, I'm sorry, just stand up. Yeah, okay, thank you. Thank you. I'm, I'm founder of QI based in Hong Kong. Huh? Anyway, it took me, I, I heard about the blockchain crypto some, some back 11 years ago, but it took me like six years to, to really onboard myself and I actually start realizing that I have to do a lot of work. I, I have to do the work myself. So my question would be, would, uh, are you expecting 
that the majority of the population would actually move into the digital economy because it's very difficult. Like I, I made a transfer, I made a mistake, it took me six months <laughs> to actually uh, yeah. retrieve the coin uh, with a slight mistake. So it's not as easy as banking right now. Such an important question, guys. So yeah, top. Uh, I, read a, I, I read a book uh, uh, that Bill Gates wrote last, uh, wrote last year, uh, How to Avoid a, Glo a Climate Disaster. He said we have to remember two numbers, 52 and zero. We are emitting 52 billion tons per year of greenhouse gas emission, and we need to reach net zero. Right? And out of the 52 billion tons, 26% comes from fossil fuel. What about the other 74%? It comes from the clothes we wear, you know, transportation, food. Pretty much we have to reduce every dimension, because during COVID, when there's no traveling, no restaurants, no hotels, we only saved 2 billion tons. We're still emitting 50 billion tons in the book, he said. That means we have to reduce every dimension. How can we not get on digital economy? Because we don't have planet B, we only have planet A. Meaning, meaning that we have to, I guess the, the solution is, here is to humanize the language okay. as well as humanize the technology. So you're basically saying it's absolutely imperative that we learn and therefore we will, but it still resolves how do we make, how do we get there? What's the bridge? Yeah, uh, and, and just to comment on this, uh, I think it's a very interesting EU initiative to produce a digital product passport that would uh, kind of uh, track the material flows from the raw material to the product that could enhance uh, 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 responsible uh, uh, economics in, 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 in consumer products. Yes. And this should be done by Web 3.0. This should be, the, the data should be collected uh, in, a, a, in such a manner that would be uh, decentralized. And this could be a kind of, if not use case, then a case study for something responsible and really useful for climate crisis mitigation. All right, so um, we have to wrap it up. I think that you know we were talking about you know tokenized economies coming alive, and I think hopefully you heard a lot of case studies uh, here across this Web three environment that's emerging. You, we talked a little some of the challenges that we face in terms of regulation and so forth. I'm not sure we fully answered your question. I'm afraid in terms of how do we get this this technology to be more user friendly, but it is a key element if we're going to unlock this incredible power of these tokenized economies. We're going to have to make this thing accessible to people in a way that doesn't become this big barrier. So so that's one thing to take away from the rest of this. I'm going to wrap it up there. A round of applause for this tremendous panel. And thank you all for coming. Okay. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.